Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay, thank you so much for those who come back. So during the break, I hear heard some students said, if we go now, the speaker will be really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you for that. And really, <laughs> it's it's fine. I have to confess that that I wanted to go myself, and <laughs> and I I resisted that desire. <laughs> okay. So uh, this is the second part of my talk. I will focus on the light matter interactions. You know, previous talk is about the electrical. Um, uh, electrical um, rectification and the, uh, the, 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 the frequency doubling kind of phenomenon. So uh, one point I want to make here is that, as you see, these nonlinear responses are not just interesting in terms of we see some new quantum geometrical effect, and also these nonlinear responses are useful Okay, in terms of energy, in terms of uh, photo de detection. Uh, the light matter interactions, uh, actually it's just the photo galvanic effect and the photo current generations that John, Julian, and David have already to told us about, and I have to repeat again, uh, just to make it complete. Okay. So the photocurrent generation is the generation of a DC current driven by the excitation of the light. Okay. So important thing to remember is that we do not apply any bias. We do not need to attach our sample to an external battery. That's what we do for transport measurement, right? And here we don't do that because the current is driven by the light. And how can it happen? So, commercially, we need a pin junction. And the importance of the pin junction is this built-in electric field. This built-in electric field breaks the symmetry and provides a directionality here. The directionality is very important because the light, the field of the light is oscillating, right? So we need a DC current out of it. How can the current know which way to go? So there needs to be some directionality here. And in this case, the directionality is the built-in electric field in the depletion region. And uh, in intrinsic materials, homogeneous materials, we can also have this directionality just from this atomic lattice, how the atoms are arranged inside the lattice. For instance, for this 1D atomic chain, ABC, ABC, three different atoms, and apparently, if you look from the left to the right, it is not the same as if we look from the right to left. So we have this directionality built into the lattice, and that directionality will translate to, you know, this Barracuda dipole and other directional um, properties in momentum space or in real space, if it is uh, 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 insulator or semiconductor, we will have the charge dipole in the, in the, in the, in the real space as well. Um, all right, so, um, uh, yeah, just as a reminder, this photo current generation is a second order response described by this chi 2 coefficient that is very sensitive to the space group symmetry of this material Okay, and it can be measured across a broad range of excitation energies as long as we have this source of the light. Um, yeah, so uh, in terms of the mechanisms, we have this injection current. The injection current is carried by the group velocities of the photo-excited carriers. One important thing here is this excitation must be non-uniform in the momentum space, otherwise the uh, group velocities in the excited states will cancel, just like in equilibrium. And this non-uniform uh, non excitation can be uh, can be can be uh, caused by some barrier effect. Um, 
And another mechanism is the shift current, which has been elaborated on by Julian. So it's basically uh, if this connection and valence bands, the center of the uh, vanilla functions uh, are um, can 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 shift in real space, and upon the photo excitation, we will have this instantaneous shift of the charge centers and leading to instantaneous uh, photo currents that is generated during the the the, the, the excitation. If we have time reversal symmetry, meaning non-magnetic materials, this injection current is often uh, uh, generated by a circular polarized light, and it's called circular injection current, whereas the shift current is generated by a linear light or non-polarized light is called linear shift current. That is, in four time reversal symmetric systems. If we now we have a, a, a magnetic material which breaks the time reversal symmetry, we can have two more, uh, which means the injection current can be generated by the linear light or non polarized light, and the shift current can be generated by the circular light. These are the four categories, and they correspond to uh, different aspects of the quantum geometry quantities of well functions. Okay, so uh, these are the experimental ex examples I will provide today. So first, again, it's in tungsten detaride. I will show you this intrinsic photo current that can be generated. And uh, second is inversion breaking via semi-metals. Uh, intrinsic photo currents can be generated. And third, I will show you that how to use this intrinsic photo currents to detect some emergent phase with chirality. Uh, so all of this um, do not um, concern magnetism. So it's all about time reversal symmetric systems. And I will give a brief outlook into you know, the magnetic versions. Okay, first, Thompson that I write. Okay, it's just 30 minutes break, so I hope you still remember this. So uh, bilayer tungsten detaride has the low enough symmetry that supports this very curved dipole perpendicular to this remaining only symmetry, the mirror plane here. And this very curved dipole can give rise to this nonlinear Hall response I just talked about. It can also give rise to a circular photogavanic effect, the circular injection current. Okay. Uh, how to understand this barrier curvature and the foot current? So it's through this selection rule. Selection rule. So imagine we have this simple two-band system, the valence band and conduction band, and we use the photon to excite. Okay? We can use a left-handed light or right-handed light to induce this excitation. And it turns out the transition probability between these two is proportional to the Barry curvature in this simple two-band model. This has been derived in this famous RMP that has been mentioned multiple times during this workshop. And this is not uh, this is not new. And most recently, this has been this selection has been uh, beautifully visualized in. Gapped graphene and the semiconducting TND monolayers that breaks inversion. So uh, you can see the K and K prime valleys have these opposite barrier curvatures due to the inversion breaking. And the circular light uh, will have this valley selection according to these opposite barrier curvatures. And one way to intuitively understand this is to think of the barrier curvature in terms of Anglo angular momentum, right? So then, this, uh, in order to conserve this angular momentum, and for this opposite barrier curvature scenarios, we have to have opposite carat of the light to compensate the different angular momentum. That's where the optical selection comes out. Now, if we have the di dipolar distribution of the barrier curvature, or asymmetric barrier curvature here, and you can imagine if we have this right-handed light, it uh, only excites this side and have a group velocity uh, that carries a current moving to the right. And if we have a left-handed light, it will, it will excite the other side of the brilliant zone and then generate a current along the other direction. Okay? 
So here, a technical uh, detail is uh, this barrier curvature we care about is no longer at the Fermi surface. It is the barrier curvature at the photo excited states. And in this nature physics paper, we formulated this barrier curved dipole by using this, you know, this um, uh, uh, photo excited states. Uh, just to compare with this. Um, uh, with the last uh, uh, lecture where, you know, the barrier dipole is about the Fermi surface. Slightly different formula. Okay, so uh, that scenario is basically this so-called circular photogalvanic effect. Right, so the phenomenology is very simple. So you shine with the left-handed light, you get a current, and you shine with the right-handed light, you get an opposite current. Okay, so... And uh, to formalize it here, these two electric fields are orthogonal provided by the circular light. Um, one way to appreciate this barrier curved dipole is that, okay, think about this. This material is homogeneous, okay? It's not pion junction, it's not shocky uh, diode. It's a homogeneous material. And the light is circularly um, symmetric, right? So then why we have the currents flowing along this direction? And this is determined by the uh, barrier dipole, which provides this directionality for you. Okay, now go to the, uh, going to the uh, measurement setup. So a common way of measuring photocurrent, especially in micro-sized device communities, is the so-called scanning photocurrent microscopy. So this setup uh, is composed of two parts because the photocurrent is basically com um, combining transport and optics, right? So one part is a transport part. So you have your device, it can be in a, a fridge uh, have, uh, with the temperature control and have the electrical feed-throughs to measure this current. And the other part is a laser part. You have to introduce a laser into the system and shine on the, on the, on the sample. And when uh, something that can be nicely done is to scan the laser uh, by using a so-called scanning mirror uh, controlled by some piezoelectric uh, thing. So we can scan, scan the laser across this sample and simultaneously measure uh, this current. And we can form a two-dimensional map of this photo current as a function of the laser position. In that way, we will know whether this current is generated uh, with the laser uh, at this contact or away from the contact or near the boundaries or away from the boundaries. Okay. Um, applying this to the, uh, to the tungsten detarite, so another uh, technical detail is here, we decide to use this, yeah, please. Yeah, the wavelength of, yeah, the wavelength of the laser. So we decide to use the CO2 laser, which produces a photon energy about 120 millieV, and this small, um, relatively small energy allows us to access the states with large barrier curvatures. And uh, this is an example of the 2D photocurrent map I just mentioned. So this is a photocurrent uh, uh, signal as a function of the laser position. And you see this blue blob here um, that suggests this is a sample area. Sorry, I didn't put the contact, etc. But this is a sample area. So basically, this response is uniform across the entire sample. If we flip the handedness of the light, you see the red thing here, which is also quite uniform from the sample area. Um, uh, I want to uh, detour a little bit to give you an example of graphene, where we do not see the uniform response from the sample. We have to rely on some uh, um, external symmetry breaking, just to, uh, for comparison. Okay? This is a work I, uh, I did uh, for my PhD, and I was working on graphene system. And the graphene has a very high symmetry and is isotropic. We do not have this intrinsic second-order photocurrent coming out of it. Um, so this is a typical uh, device. You know, this size is five micrometers. It's pretty small, and uh, uh, we have these electrodes. Okay. Um, we also shape this graphene into this weird shape, 
And why? Because, you know, as I said, graphene has a high symmetry. We need to break the symmetry using other ways. The contact is obviously where we can break the symmetry. And also, you know, if we, uh, uh, you know, define the shape, the geometry of the sample here, we also break the, uh, uh, break the symmetry. And indeed, so here is a foot current map. Uh, the, we scan the laser and measure a current. When the graphene is highly doped, we see the signals coming from the contact. And we have opposite signals for these two contacts, okay? similar here. And when graphene is intrinsic, is at the charge neutrality, we can see the response from this uh, ge uh, geometrically defined uh, symmetry broken area. Okay. but nothing from um, uh, um, the uniform area. Okay. So this just to give you an example that when you work with the small sized samples, you need to be careful with these contact junctions and the boundaries and the shape of the flake, and they will contribute to, uh, to, to the full current responses always. Okay. Now, so let's go to the uh, go to the inversion breaking by semi-metals, and this has already been discussed, so I can go uh, very quickly. So, uh, uh, so, so, so um, inversion break uh, breaking by semi-metals. So we will have the second order response. So one example is the shift current, which has been derived and elaborated on. Um, already, uh, just very briefly, we excite from, uh, from, from this band to that band, and this can correspond to a shift of the vinyl centers in the real space, and we'll have, have some, 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 uh, some instantaneous shift current. And as long as the sample, uh, the material has the low enough symmetry, we will in the end have, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know globally a current coming out of it. And this cover nicely uh, illustrates this, and uh, I'm not sure you can see this yellow arrows uh, closely. So, so basically there is this uh, shift, you know, um, uniformly from every unit uh, cell. Uh, so experimentally people, people see, yeah. Sorry, just when you were showing at the interfaces, when you had like your contacts, that you get the signal from there. Um, just curiosity, do you understand why? Because you still have the bulk, so you should still get the signal there. Is there some intersection or like? Is there some? Oh, you mean here? It yeah, does not exactly. show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 understand because. Yeah. Uh, so so here, especially, you can you you can imagine, uh, you know, the graphene is at uh, uh, so 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 the chemical potential is here, and the contact uh, it also has its Fermi level. So so at this point, they are pretty much aligned. We do not have a strong electric field near the contacts, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so you yeah. need that in order to. Um, because right here you see, like, you show that you get the signal from exactly the intersection of the yeah, contacts, here, right? and not like in the middle like you showed before. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it, w what happens at this interface? Is at this interface? Yeah, exactly. That you <laughs> that more or less it's 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 more or less screening whatever you had in the photovoltaic effect, mm. which you would have in the bulk. In the middle. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 I mean, symmetry level. So, so, as I said, if your laser is here, you know, the graphene lattice is very isotropic. Yeah. So there is n no pre uh, preferential direction for the current to flow. So you won't see a full current response if your laser is here. Ah, okay. Yeah. Only when your laser is here, you know, there is a clear, you know, uh, in equivalent up and down. So ah. something can happen there to rectify this. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's a different material than what you showed before. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that is a point. So yeah. the, 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 the tungsten detarite uh, has this kind of symmetry um, uh, to, to, uh, that allows for the intrinsic foot current coming from the bulk, but graphene doesn't. It has to rely on all these junctions. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, back to the shift current in tantalum marsnide. It has been observed by my colleague at Boston College, Ken Birch. So the point has already been made that the, 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 the response can be quite large. Um, 
And also in this tantalum uridium tyrite, um, people also find you know, the response, especially for low, uh, low power, it can approach the commercial detectors. So something useful. Uh, since the shift current has already been discussed, I will focus on something with circular power light. Yeah. So from the discussions yesterday, it seemed to follow that um, the relaxation processes were important in determining the actual magnitude of this. Yeah, uh, shift yeah, current. yeah, exactly. So does it have strong temperature dependence because of that? Yeah. Was it there? Did I just not notice? Or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a very nice question. So, so, so here, approaching commercial low temperature detectors. So it needs, um, the low temperature response is bigger. So, again, from, from the discussion yesterday, it seemed like uh, phonons and phon phonon, you know, uh, mediated relaxation, so yeah. to speak, was, was important. So, um, does, does the signal go up at low temperature? or does Go it, up, yes. It goes up. Yeah, it goes up in general, yeah. It seemed a little bit strange. Now, so mm -hmm. I was explained that if the rate of relaxation is non-existent, it's zero, right? Then there is no current in the steady state, right? It's a tra transient phenomenon. But then at low temperature, that's what happens, right? The relaxation rate goes uh, goes down, 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 and it seems like you shouldn't be getting a, a sig signal. No, a am I am I getting it wrong? Yeah, I I, I think uh, uh -huh. John has something to say. <laughs> Is <clears throat> when you talk about low detectors, there are you comparing your results at low detectors uh, to low temperature detectors, or have you done your experimental results at different temperatures? Okay, so first of all, this is not my uh, oh, sorry. my measurement. That work, who's ever, who's ever <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so it's the same work that uh, Julian. Uh, Mentioned so, ah. so I if I remember correctly, uh, they measure the temperature dependence, and uh, in, uh, I remember the trend is uh, the response is reduced at room uh, by increasing the temperature. Right. Yeah, I think. Yeah, the, but that's that's not. I don't think that's crazy. No, no, no. Right. That that would be. Mm. Go ahead. Yeah. Know that finally, pure shift current explanation was ruled out in other arguments. Um, they are measuring in plane, and the shift current doesn't have any uh, in plane allowed. Uh, in plane allowed. It's uh, a third order. It, they argued it's a third order effect that does now have. Um, well, the, we know the expression with respect to the relaxation time. So it's a, either a modified, I think it's not still clear uh, what's the effect. We also propose another effect, but these are now modified the stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, all right. I, I have something more to say, but may, maybe after the talk. Yeah. Um, all right, so I will focus on the, um, the Kyrolite case. Um, so uh, one thing I feel beautiful is that, you know, in uh, semi-metals, uh, this one node is called uh, wild fermions, right? The excitation, uh, the chiral fermions. And uh, just intuitively, you would expect the chiral lights should couple to the chiral fermions, right? Because they both have the chirality. But exactly how? This is again through this Berry curvature. So uh, this is, uh, you know, a balcon along one uh, uh, direction. So for the right movers, you have positive barrier curvature, and for the left movers, you have a negative barrier curvature. And of course, the barrier curvature is along uh, one direction that can be defined positive or negative. So it's quite similar to the barrier curvature dipole case that I just show, right? And this will have this optical selection. So. For one uh, chirality, it will excite one side and, for, uh, and, and, and block the other side. So this will generate a current. Okay? 
Um, but it's not that simple. Remember, um, Jan and others have already told us that the wire nodes always come in pair. So what if we have the other pair? So then the, the, the kind of barrier dipole will flip and it will generate opposite current. So this pair of uh, wire nodes will lead to canceled foot currents. Okay? But that's not the end of the story, because the question is why this vehicle must be upright. Okay, I, I remember someone asked about tilting, right? So, so the vehicle can be tilted, and that's exactly true if these wire nodes are, uh, are at generic points in the uh, in the momentum space. There is no symmetry to 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 make it upright. So we will have this tilting. And the significance, the consequence of the tilting uh, together with a finite chemical potential is this so-called polyblock K. So what does this mean? So you see here, uh, the Fermi level is here. Uh, if uh, uh, within a certain window of the excitation energy, you will have this scenario. So on the right, the excitation is blocked because the final states are already occupied. But on the left, it's allowed because the final states are empty. So this, so, uh, this poly block, blockade provides an extra selection on top of the chiral selection. And this, this poly selection could be asymmetric for uh, this node and that node. And this will lead to the lifting of the cancellation. Okay. So basically, this cancellation is not there as long as the response is allowed by the crystal symmetry. And I will show a dramatic example later to help you visualize that. Um, ten, in 10 to Mars night, because we have 24 wire nodes as generic points in brilliant zone, to you know, microscopically figure out the tilting, uh, the cancellation, is quite uh, uh, time consuming and uh, um, not easy. But we did that in the supplement of this paper. Uh, uh, so just to show you the experiment. Um, okay, so again, so guided by the symmetry analysis. We know uh, we will have this CPG response if we shine a circular light along the A direction and measure the current along the uh, B direction, or vice versa. So we file down the ball crystal um, along the A direction that allows the normal incidence of the circular light um, and measure the response along B direction. And we see this circular photogalvanic effect this curve, I will repeat it again and again. So basically, you know, uh, the x-axis is the uh, uh, um, polarization of the light from left-handed to linear to right-handed to linear to, uh, uh, sorry, from right-handed RCP to linear to left-handed RCP and uh, so on and so forth. And the photocurrent is oscillating with this polarization. Particularly, there is a huge difference between RCP and LCP, and that is the CPG current we are looking for. Okay, so a dramatic example of the polyblock K is this. If these two wild nodes are not energetically degenerate, if they are separated in energy, and if we put the Fermi level here, then this node will be completely blocked, and it uh, we only have this one. And this is exactly the chiral, uh, the, 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 the chiral uh, crystal thing that uh, the previous speakers mentioned. Okay, so, yeah, so this will be very nice, right? Now, um, I want to ask is, why in Tantra Marsanite, these two Y nodes must be at the same energy? I mean, this has already been explained, and does anyone know why? Okay, so um, it's basically, um, for something like this, we need to go to the symmetry. So there must be some symmetry that guarantees this, and it turns out to be the, to, uh, the mirror symmetries in Tantum Mars Night. So the mirror symmetry here, 
uh, if you have the mirror symmetry, it will relate a positive node to a negative node. Okay. Um, so here is a way to understand this from the Barry curvature. Let's say this is a negative node, so all the Barry curvature is going into it. Okay. And this is a mirror plan. Barry curvature is a pseudo vector. Therefore, if it is along the mirror plan, this pseudo vector must flip side. But if it is perpendicular to the plan, it does not switch side. And this way, you can see this sink becomes source. Okay. So, uh, because of this relation, with uh, if we have any mirror symmetry in vial, these two opposite chirality nodes must be at the same energy. Similarly, we can do um, analysis for inversion symmetry, and for rotor inversion symmetry, rotation time reversal, etc. And you'll find that only rotation and time reversal do not reverse this chirality uh, of the nodes. And therefore, only these two are allowed if we want to have this separation between these two nodes. Is that clear? Okay, and uh, if a material does not have inversion mirror and rotor inversion, that is exactly this chiral group. Okay, so it's a subgroup of the non central symmetric group, and tantum marsonite is here. Okay, and this is an illustration of a chiral crystal, it's like a DNA molecule. I right? have the left handed version and right handed version, and this kind of material will have this scenario. And this is exactly the kind of system that can support the quantized CPG um, um, in, yeah, it is a chiral crystal. Um, and the critical thing is now everything can be, you know, the in integral is just around one wild node, not around, um, not, due, uh, not from this broken wild nodes from both. Um, so, uh, yeah, in this nice paper that formalized this quantized response, uh, how to measure this? Um, first, we need to identify a real material that to measure. And this rhodium silicide and cobalt silicide are two candidates that people found that are promising. Uh, this, uh, this paper is theoretically compute uh, you know, this uh, CPG coefficient. Uh, as a function of the excitation energy. And you can see within this window of the photo, uh, excitation energies, you can see rough, um, I mean, not 100%, uh, not but close to the quantization number. So this is um, the material that we can look into. So uh, uh, another thing is for this chiral crystal, due to the symmetry, this CPG current is actually have to be along the same direction as the light propagates. Okay, this is a steady state. Huh? Yeah. No, I, I think it's because of exciting other uh, bands, something, if Adolf can come. Uh, why it drops. Yeah, other, yeah. Yeah, so, um, this is what we uh, did with uh, uh, continuous wave light and measure the steady state current. Uh, so uh, you can see this is measure along the transverse direction to the light propagate, uh, propagation. This one also. And we do not see the CPG response. It's flat as a function of the polarization. And only when we measure in the longitudinal way, Ah, you know, when the current passes along the same direction as the light, we see this large CPG response. It is quite large, so this, the response is there. N the next question is how to measure this quantization. Okay, so the quantization is not for the steady state current. Okay, it's for the, this initial state. It's about the rate, how the current is injected into the system. So it's, you know, if we measure uh, in steady state, we have to consider all the scattering uh, relaxation processes, 
right? So we will never have the quantization in steady state, and we need to do a time resolve measurement with ultra short laser pulse, which may allow us to access you know, the initial stage. And that kind of uh, experimental setup is called you know, terahertz emission. So uh, here, we need to use the ultra-short pulse of the light to excite this foot current. And this foot current will be transient. And this transient foot current will generate the terahertz emission. The terahertz will be emitted from this sample. And then we will have a, some kind of terahertz, de uh, terahertz detector to detect this emitted terahertz wave and to understand how much car uh, current is there. So the detector has to be activated by another short pulse. This is called electro-optic sampling. Okay? We can vary the time delay between this excitation beam and this detection beam. Okay, so it, then we are like taking a snapshot of this terahertz wave. Okay, so you can imagine if we uh, um, uh, activate this detection at time t, we're actually we're looking at a terahertz generated at a time t. So we'll have the current profile as a function of temperature, uh, as a function of time, basically. I'm not personally doing this in my lab. So I uh, find this picture from online. So it's a very, uh, it's quite complicated experiment, uh, optical experiment. It's not easily done, uh, even for bulk samples and for uh, 2D samples, for micro-sized samples, it is even more difficult. And I'm not aware of any of this measurement actually in free space for 2D materials yet. So for this, uh, uh, this, uh, this chiral, uh, chiral Bio or chiral multi fold fermion candidates. And these two groups, one from uh, Joe Arnstein's group and one from Leon Wu's group, have, 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 have tried very nicely. Um, so, first, they see you know, the response depends on the clarity of the light. So, they, uh, this, this response switches sign. This is some terrible signal. You can uh, imagine it is. Um, uh, related to the foot current. And another thing that I see is a kind of plateaued response uh, uh, within some photo excitation window, kind of similar to this theoretical computation here. But there is one a significant difference here. This is beta. Beta is the coefficient, you know, in the, uh, basically the coefficient in the quantization, uh, in the, in, in the, um, quantized number, but here it's beta times tau. So we still have uh, relaxation time here. And why? And this is because even in this measurement, by using 100 fathom second pulse, we're still in the quasi steady state because the tau is just so short. It's like eight femtosecond. So basically, we need to use uh, shorter pulse, uh, maybe one femtosecond, or even, uh, I don't know, the, the, the even sh shorter version um, for this measurement. It becomes m m very, very challenging. Okay, so uh, now uh, let me show you something um, not predicted. Um, so in this uh, chiral crystal, chiral uh, bio uh, multifold uh, crystals. One interesting uh, conceptual uh, thing is now this structure chirality, like a DNA molecule, can control this electronic chirality, which is a chirality of the vial node. Right? If for some reason we can uh, in situ switch the chirality of the uh, lattice structure, we can switch the chirality of the vial node. Okay. Uh, but usually this process is just very difficult. Um, for instance, you ha uh, have these chiral crystals, and this chirality is fixed during chemical growth. And this chirality is determined by the chemical bonds. If we want to you know, change it from here to here, we have to first break the chemical bonds, and that, that uh, has, has to be very energy costly. And, uh, 
We physicists cannot do that. Maybe chemists can do that. Um, so what a physicist can do is to utilize something called emergence, right? We like emergence. So is there any emergent chirality that we can utilize? And turns out there is. Uh, um, actually, this becomes uh, more and more, uh, the, 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 there are more and more uh, materials like that. But the first one that people propose this emergent chirality uh, is this uh, titanium diselenide. Um, so titanium diselenide is a layered, um, layered uh, correlated semi-metal. It has a charge density wave around 200 Kelvin. So the charge density, uh, density wave uh, was thought to be a 3Q CDW, meaning you have 3Q vectors rotated by 180 degrees, and they should be equivalent. However, this STM measurement finds something strange, uh, which let them propose this Cairo CDW model, where you know these 3Q vectors are not exactly equivalent. Instead, the dominant Q vectors rotates along the Z direction. Okay. Can you imagine it's a charge density kind of rotate like a DNA molecule? And this has been, a uh, similar phenomena has been observed in this uh, uh, Kagome uh, metal 135, and also in this uh, quantum spin liquid candidate tantalum disulfide. This one is STM measurement, this one is RPAS measurements. So there is still debate on, on, on whether or not this is indeed chiral. Uh, so, and, and, and whether or not this is uh, CDW, etc., I won't go into that. I just tell you what we observe. So, we want to use this nonlinear foot current, this uh, particularly this longitudinal uh, CPG, as a probe of this chirality. Okay? So, um, this can be done by rigorous symmetry analysis, but here, pictorially, I want to show you this longitudinal CPG is uniquely sensitive to the material chirality. So imagine here we have a non-chiral object, okay? Then we will have a mirror plane uh, that relate it, uh, related to itself, okay? And then if we shine the uh, uh, left-handed light, Okay. After this mirror uh, operation, it becomes right-handed, and if it can generate this longitudinal current, this current doesn't change. So this entire thing means uh, the same object will generate the same current upon um, uh, left or right-handed light. So there is no CPG, because CPG is defined as a difference between this. Okay. Now, if, uh, if we have a chiral object, the situation is different because now this mirror has to uh, convert it to its uh, partner, right? Now, they are not the same. So we do not have such constraint that, you know, um, like this, okay? There can be difference between left and right hand light. Um, okay, so just to remind you, this is what we see in this chiral crystal when it's when it definitely has this chirality. And we're looking for this curve. We're looking for this curve in order to say um, the material has chirality. Okay, so we have this titanium diselenide sample and we fabricate to the top electrode using graphene because graphene is transparent. It allows the light to come in. We have the bottom electrode. Uh, the light uh, comes like this, and measure, we measure this vertical current. Uh, this is at high temperature above the TC of the CDW, and we see a rather flat uh, curve. It does not depend much on the, uh, on the polarization. And then we go down to low temperature, um, 50 Kelvin. Uh, this is below the CDW transition already, and we don't see much, especially if you look at the left hand uh, LCP, left handed or right handed, they're the same. So we do not have CPG. So it's a negative result. So that could be several reasons. The first is okay, there is no chirality. Um, and second, our technique is not sensitive enough. Yes? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe I'm, I'm just saying bullshit, but um, 
there is the metal electron on the back, so you get a reflection, no, from the Cairo. Uh, yeah. that's a good point. Yeah. Is Continue. it like, and is it then in the other, like, I don't know, like, is, is it then in the other direction polarized? Yeah. So we intentionally uh, try to avoid that. Yeah. So the penetration depth of the light is about 100 nanometers. So we intentionally uh, make the sample like a few hundreds of nanometers yeah. thick. And we also check the thickness dependence, and it, uh, it's all consistent. Okay. So we don't think the reflected light, maybe there is, but it shouldn't. Um, be something uh, concerning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, about this negative results uh, could be different reasons, and particularly, uh, you know, so if it forms this chirality, so the just like the, the life, you know, what the, there's a question, a long-standing question in life science, why the DNA is left-handed, not right-handed, etc. So, so the left-handed and right-handed should be equivalent. So why it chooses one over the other? Okay, Probably no uh, particular reason. And then uh, there will be uh, you know, the domains of opposite chirality, and the opposite chirality will generate uh, the opposite photocurrent. And if this domain size is smaller than our laser beam, and everything will be averaged out. And this is quite possible. And if it is the case, how should we do? So then we borrow uh, some with them from you know, the magnetic training of ferromagnet. And now you know, we go up to high temperature and cool down into again. But this time, during this cooling, we have this left-handed light in presence all the time. And then we see this actually quite, quite large CPG uh, signal comes out uh, at 50 Kelvin. And then we, 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 we gradually warm up and measure the CPG. Uh, and you can see it suddenly uh, disappear around the transition temperature. Um, and then we decide to warm, uh, warm up again and cool down with uh, uh, right-handed light. And can you guess what happened? Yeah, so, so everything flipped. And this can be repeated multiple times on multiple samples. It's all very consistent. It's very robust results. So I don't want to say too much about the microscopic origins, etc., because it's basically it's just a symmetry probe. <laughs> um, uh, but one thing that may tell us a little bit about the microscopics is the photon energy dependence. So we try to use different photon energies uh, from visible to all the way to, oh yeah, please. Yeah, so, okay, so, yeah, just to draw the analogy to ferromagnet, right? So the field cool and uh, non-field cool, right? What will happen if you cool down a ferromagnet? So you have the spin pointing to different directions, right? Only if you use the external field, try to align the spin, you have a net kind of response. And here, similarly, I imagine originally you have this free energy picture, Right, and this some kind of order parameters de determines this 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 clarity. Sorry, something like this, and this is left and this right. They are equivalent, and you have these domains. And 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 if we cool down with the circular light, maybe you know the right one becomes energetically favorable. Or, you know, it falls into the same. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, Pri was talking about inverse uh, Faraday effect, which was exactly this, but for, for magnetization, right? Yeah, it yeah, was an yeah. effective field yeah, that yeah, causes yeah. intensity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. What's, what's the analog of magnetization for this uh, you know, chiral charge density wave that actually tells it to you know, twist from, from Z to Z like this or like that? What is the analog of an uh, effective magnetic field? Or you mean whatever? the formula? Or the, 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 formula the, or the nature, no, not the formula, but uh, what, what does it do? We don't know. If we trust the previous STM measurement, it's the char charge density. 
It's a charge density mod modulated. So literally, charge density modulation yeah. because yeah. of intensity of your of your yes. light that yes. tells you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which but we don't know. It could be related to spin. So, so it's just uh, we we haven't measured on the magnetic field and see how it responds. So we don't know the microscopics. All right. Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, so, 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 so one thing that might be relevant to the microscopics is this photoenergy energy dependence. So we tried to use different photoenergies energies for this training and also for the detection. So we see this effect is the largest if we use the infrared photon. Um, and why is that? So one quick thing that we can think about is this charge density wave in titanium diselenide, which has been measured with APAS, and the CDW gap is around 100 mEV. That's uh, all I, <laughs> probably I can say. Um, okay, so uh, so far all the examples are in non-magnetic system, except the last one we don't know. Maybe there is some magnetic, uh, some magnetic structure associated with that. So. <laughs> Okay, so the outlook is that, uh, quickly make, yeah, the outlook will be what will happen in magnetic systems. Okay, so um, it will, we will have circular shift and linear injection. And moreover, uh, from the last lecture, I told you about the MBT material with, uh, for which the even number of layers have a PT symmetry. And in this case, we only have this two, not this two. And they will correspond to uh, other aspects of the quantum well functions, such as, again, quantum metric uh, and some other things. So it will be interesting to explore this. Okay, and um, more you can find in this recent uh, review articles. And I, I, by the way, I saw a poster actually um, clearly wanted to do this. And hopefully, yeah, there will be something coming out soon. Okay, with that, I'm happy to answer any more questions. Yeah, since uh, all the compounds you have mentioned have different uh, properties for left and right circularly polarized light, it should show curve rotation, right? Show chiral... Curve rotation, the curve rotation, the rotation of... Curve rotation. Yes, yes. Uh, let me think. So, so, so... Even though in very small magnitude, no. Impossible. In transmission... It will show Faraday rotation, right? In transmission. Yeah, in transmission. But yeah. if you... Yeah. yeah, 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 but we could. I mean, if you use a thinner, yeah, yeah. Uh, two questions, if I could. Could you go back to the slide where you didn't see the difference between the circular and the, uh, the, the two different circular polar... That, that, yeah, that one there. Now, it, it looks to me, from those two graphs, as if you see more signal mm. for linearly polarized light and less signal for circularly polarized light, no matter what direction the circular polarization is in. Is that, is that right? Mm, looks is that like statistically it. significant? Yeah, is that difference yeah. sig statistically significant? Um, so... I don't, um, I think it is uh, s significant in the sense that it is quite robust, and mm -hmm. I, if I remember clearly, it's three years now, so oh, okay. yeah, we, 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 we always see this, um, but it's not surprising to, to us experimentally because we have all the interfaces. I see, so yeah. you can blame it on the interfaces, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Mm. Yeah, and also it does not change um, across the transition, so we didn't okay. pay too much attention. Yeah. Okay. The second question had to do with when you when you were talking about the electro-optic sampling mm. and the hundred femtosecond, you know, even quasi steady state for hundred femtosecond. Yeah. So uh, why? I guess I don't 
quite understand what's going on here. You've got, there are pulses that are coming in of a few picoseconds, right? Oh, me here? Yeah. I mean, if I look at the slide to the, or the diagram to the left, everything is on a picosecond time scale, right? Mm hmm And so it's, uh, you know, a picosecond, 100 femtoseconds is only a tenth of that. I mean, that's, uh, you know, I mean, people have seen, in other experiments, people have injected with picosecond pulses relaxation times on the order of 100 femtoseconds and you know they've seen they've seen the dynamics mm -hmm. so i don't under don't quite understand why it's not being seen here yeah yeah please i'm not sure that's actually the microphone yeah 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 maybe i yeah because i feel i alluded to because i we also have like with Liang Wu, who mm. also measure measure this, um, uh, we estimated the scattering time uh, from different. Uh, so, for example, you can measure linear response as well, and nonlinear response, and then try to fit both with the same scattering time, like the same broadening, let's say, and though that gives you a, a, an estimate, and I think it it turns out to be larger than what this uh, estimate. Uh, so it means like more disorder, let's say, than than it was uh, pointed out in this paper. And then it's more disorder. Yeah, it's, it's actually what you, what so is it's short, the scattering time is shorter. It's even shorter I, than eight. Yeah, and I think I, I don't remember the number. Maybe maybe mm -hmm. I have to double check. But uh, but cobalt silicide, on the other hand, has a longer. Uh, so I think that comment applies more to cobalt silicide than. Um, but yeah, I mean, here. Yeah, there are many things that can be going on, but so yeah. The simple model here is is, is just dj dt equals yeah. something minus j over tau. Is that not right? I mean, yeah. yeah. Minus j. I, I, I don't, I, no matter what tau is, it seems to me you'll, you'll see something. I mean, if tau is very, very short, you won't see very much. Right. But, but, but they do see something. Yeah, but, it, yeah. So <laughs> Mm -hmm. I mean, if yeah. We would predict they would see something. What's the problem? I, I mean, I think if you look at the number, it's just not exactly quantized. So then you you have to, um, like, if if that would be so, if we, it would be the intrinsic signature, then it would be exactly quantized without like having to resort to any scattering time, basically. Plus, you can. But the thing is, like, you cannot explain you cannot explain the shape. Uh, of both the linear and the nonlinear conductivities without invoking a scattering time, or like at least phenomenologically, let's say, or like that, yeah, exactly, yeah, and that, yeah, and that gives you a scattering time, and they consistently give the same, yeah, yeah. So the best fit, let's say, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. Great, we have all the experts here that we, I don't even need to explain. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> Um, did someone, yes, so did someone uh, confirm this chiral charge density wave if there are more bulk techniques such as X-ray diffraction or they only saw that in STM and RPS? Yeah, so um, that's a very nice suggestion and I think, uh, yeah, so um, uh, people wanted to do this, um, but you have to have, uh, uh, without this um, chiral training stuff, you need to have a very local probe. You know, if this CDW forms um, tiny, tiny domains. If you have a global probe, most of the responses will just be averaged to zero, just like what I initially show you. So therefore, if you want to do X-ray or want to do APAS, it has to be nano resolved. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So usually titanium the selenite is doped. Uh, when you grow it due to selenium vacancies and so on, did you estimate the doping in your system? Um, okay, I, uh, I guess we didn't quite care about that because our photo excitation is still large. So the, yeah. 
the small chemical potential change sh shouldn't affect much. Okay, yeah. and the second question is, uh, as far as I remember in your paper, you also measured the transverse CPG. Uh, that is zero, right? Does yeah, this mean that yeah. you have threefold symmetry? Uh, the transverse, yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, so the threefold rotational symmetry does not broke. Okay, break. thank you. Yeah. to, I think we're reaching the end. Um, okay. yeah. So I'm going to make an announcement, but first uh, let's thank uh, Sean Ma. For <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Very nice.